Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host, oh yes, your host, of the Break It Down show, your Break It Down show, and you guys know why I say that, because I really truly believe this is our adventure, our study of all things life. You know, we we get these great guests on all the time, and uh, you know you know I like to move it around and, and change things up. We've got a bunch of great stuff planned for the next few weeks. I think you're really going to love it. But the, I wanted to say, for a lot of you who are newer, we move the ball. We go explore things, whether it's social issues, combat issues, arts, music, whatever it is. We're going to try to get into it and try to understand it even better. And today's episode is no different. Now, a lot of you may know already, I spent a lot of time in the field. And a lot of that time was spent in something called the human terrain system, where my job was to go out every day and help the commander win. Now, technically, it's considered a, an anthropological kind of position where you go out and understand the people. But in reality... We were coded as intel workers, which which is sort of a, a way to say that we went out and collected intelligence. And depending on who you were and what you did, the intelligence either was or wasn't focused on threat. All right. That's the basics of it. The cool thing is today I've got Trent Laux, who was uh, a team leader when I was doing one of my tours. I'd come back and rotated home and was going to go back out. So I had to go through refresher training, which is hilarious because I was already good at the job, but whatever. Um, and so I met up with Trent and another guy named John Allen and their cohort of class. And we all went through this uh, field training together and then scattered out and deployed out to the wind and all had these different experiences. The reason why I say you all this background is that Trent ended up running the program when we came back and ultimately I think closed the doors on the main body of the program but as we understand combat and ultimately look a lot of you probably aren't going to care about this episode this is stuff that's a little bit heady a little bit wonky but if you listen carefully you'll hear a lot of the themes from what we've done in other st other shows so uh, bear with us on this this is paying a, a bigger bill in that we're trying to help the next battle the next war the next warrior understand that these capabilities are out there how to use them why we had them and just create these you know practical learning learning tools that will help us all fight better and also i think you probably will enjoy i think you'll find it interesting uh if not whatever let me know send put it in the remarks let me know i mean it's interesting these, these kind of shows that i really push us academically away from a comfort zone and not a lot of people ever get to hear this story and a lot of people even if they've done the job weren't terribly good at it because it's a really hard job to get done well. Yours truly is probably the best, if not top three HTS people ever. And you probably get that same story from everybody you talk to. But here the reality is, is I'm telling you guys these stories so you all can hear it and hopefully enjoy the stories of HTS. So John Allen, who I call, I dubbed the light beer panda, and, uh, and we can go into that some other time. And Trent Laux and I are going to break it down a little bit. Hey, and, and just because uh, if you're new to the show or if you're coming in from somewhere else or you're an HTS person from the past, um, the sound quality got a little dicey for a while. So I apologize for that. Don't often mention it because you just can't control all the very variables and I think it was one of those days where there were sunspots so nothing you can do about sunspots but I think I cleaned it up pretty good you should be able to get through it hey real quick the save the brave rifle raffle is still going on you can go to blackstonearms.com and buy a ticket for a hundred dollars the rifle is a five thousand dollar value so uh you know if even if you don't win you're donating a hundred bucks to save the brave and if you do you got a hell of a rifle built by a really really cool dude all right uh, that is the basics for that. I know you're going to enjoy this. Just give it a minute. Trent Laux, everybody. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Trent Laux, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. There it is. All right. A little bit of uh, technical and lag stuff going on here as we get started and settle in. Also, I have in studio with me the panda, John Allen, fellow uh, Army veteran. All three of us are Army guys. We all belong to the Human Terrain System program at one point. Trent ran the program, and it's, uh, it's really neat to be able to talk to someone at the very top when you got guys like John and myself at the very bottom working on the ground trying to provide the information that that 
Trent needs to get everybody what they need at as at the at the big customer level. So thanks, fellas, for coming on and having this chat. Also, by the way, John's drinking a little bit, so we're gonna and it's Friday, so we're gonna cut it up a little bit and not be too serious, but we are gonna have a pretty, pretty fun and serious conversation. Trent, hey, great to see you and great to see you, John. It's been 10 years basically, fellas, since we've done this. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think you and I like it was just yesterday. Like last four days, like uh, debriefing up in East Virginia, and that was it. Trent, what have you? You're still in the area because this whole program was was centered out of Leavenworth. What are you doing today? Uh, today, I'm still in the Army Reserves and working as a CGSC instructor, Command General Staff College there at Fort Leavenworth, and then uh, that's my part time job. My full time job I work at the Mission Command Battle Lab. AI capabilities for uh, the mission command information systems. That's fancy. I mean, AI wasn't even a thing we talked about in the army 10 years ago, and already you have people working that task. It's incredible. Let's back up in time, though. Let's go back to the HTS days. You guys went through the, the full training together. When you went through that training without your, like, boss man hat on, but just like, you know, Colonel Trent going through this thing, how was the training going through the schoolhouse for you to prepare you for the job that everybody was going to do on the battlefield? Well, honestly, I think that the training was not up to the standard that it needed to be. Remember that it was a prototype program where they were really trying to figure it out. And it was uh, they were trying to use lessons learned from the Vietnam area when they did uh, chords. I believe they really transitioned the training more towards the non-military folks and trying to get them up to speed with integrating like our social scientists. There was there was less social science training for us army folks who, you know, are the knuckle draggers and there was more military training. And when you look at the pop- population and demographics of the students going through, a majority of them were military. So it was a lot of uh, basic training all over again. John, what about you? What was your experience? You've been through a lot of training throughout the years when you were in the Army. How was it for you? Was it preparing you for the battlefield? It kind of felt like a, like Trent was saying, it felt like a repeat for me. Because the, I think, 90 days before I uh, took off to Kansas City to attend over there, I was actually in Afghanistan in, uh, as part of the PRT. So I was a civil military operations chief out of one of the PRTs. And so when I got back, I mean, I, I recognized a lot of the stuff that they were trying to teach us just simply because I didn't, I ended up doing it for the last, you know, a couple of years before that. So yeah, it really felt like it was trained towards the civilian personnel. So I'm sure some of it was great for them. Um, like, I can't remember the guy that was in my gun truck, but he was, uh, when we, did that final training exercise down the pole come the convoy. Yeah. So watching him work at 240 and almost spray the truck behind us was fun, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being that we were never going to run a convoy by ourselves. Yeah. Here, that, that just seemed like extra, you know, extra fun time for the army. people. And just for the audience to understand. So, so there's uh the training you often go through if you've never been in the military is you go somewhere and you do something, whatever that something is, because our job is a very unique job. They sort of threw a lot of things out. like the training these guys went through was different than the training that I had experienced just 18 months, maybe prior to that, it was a totally different experience. And so the army was trying to figure out what, what to do, but what happens at least in terms of my career, and all the times I deployed, I essentially, the training effect was like, I figure like five or 10% overall, like, did I need to know this prior to deploying? And it just, it was one of those things where they gave us very interesting classes. Uh, they taught us a thing called coin and every teacher would say something different about how coin worked. And you're like, okay, well, since you guys don't know, uh, apparently it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just going to coin the way I coin. It's so all these problems gave us this give us this knowledge base to try to go do a job, but they never like to said, here's the job. Here's what you're going to do day to day. Like they really struggled to give us those tools and the ability to integrate within the army. Then after that, we went to a practical exercise, which wasn't available the first time I went through. So I deployed, I stayed for, you know, uh, several rotations and then I came back and they're like, now you have to go through this tactical training so you can certify to, to deploy. And that's where I met up with these guys. And we did, 
again, like an actual, like basic training type thing. It wasn't, you know, up in the morning at five and then getting yelled at and that kind of thing. But we got up early. We worked all day and that, that sort of thing. It was very expensive training for a bunch of uh, military civilians oh, yeah. to have to go through. What were your guys's, I guess, Trent, you go first. What were your thoughts on the Polk experience and, and what was given to us in terms of the value on the ground once we got to Afghanistan or where Iraq or wherever we ended up going? Pete, uh, interestingly enough, that whole, we, what we went through was the combat advisor course. Uh, it origi- originated at Fort Riley, Kansas with the uh, 1st Infantry Division. I was actually part of that planning process with that whole training together. I thought that I needed to do is ground range, you know, and um, good tr- pressure training for me. You can learn something new every every time, and repetition builds muscle memory. So um, I thought that was a better choice than the CRC that they did at the Fort Benning for for our folks um, prior to the, the Fort Polk experience. Yeah, there's some truth to that for sure. And then the, you broke up a little bit, so I'll kind of fill the holes in. He was saying that he was part of the training process in designing the training and making the choices and trying to find the right place to put people who hadn't been in the military. And for those of us that had been in the military, the ability to maintain our, our combat muscle and be able to, you know, just validate that, you know, we still knew how to point uh, the, the gun in the right direction. John, what about you? What were your experiences? You know, as a guy that had just got back from deployment, like me, you go through this training. I, I struggled to take it seriously. You might've been able to tell that, but what about you? Same boat. So I I kind of loved watching everybody come out to formation in the morning because you'd have the Air Force guys. We were there with the uh, Air Force team. And they would be lined up dress right for us, you know, as 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 military looking as the Air Force can. We'd be off in our own little gaggle off to the left. Be like, all right, here we'll just kind of I don't know. Let's make it look like we're kinda in a formation over here. Uh, you got Rob getting yelled at for cutting off the sleeves to his army PTs. That was fun. Yes. <laughs> him howling at the moon trying to say, hey, that's okay. And I'm just there. okay, let's let's do this so I can either go back to the rack or <laughs> go find something else to do. Yeah. Um, the training there was fun. I mean, when we were actually doing training stuff, I remember the land nav was kind of a blast. So especially when you're just dragging a couple social scientists behind you. It was more fun just giving them the map and be like, all right, I hope you remember this because I don't. The most fun I had is when we did the uh, combat lifesaver. Oh, man. I had Anders Core. You guys remember him? Harvard guy? Harvard. So this guy, oh, his own blood. And honestly, by this time, he kind of pissed me off. So <laughs> <laughs> I remember... I'm getting ready to do the IV on him. So I stick the IV in him. I didn't have the catheter plug. You know how you find the, find the vein? Yeah. Take that in, pull out it, and put in the, uh, put in the IV piece. I forgot the technical terms. So I pulled it out, and then I just turn around. I'm like, oh, man, where, where's, where's the plug? <laughs> so, <laughs> so listening to Andrew shriek a little bit, that was fun. Yeah. So I'll put that in. Kevin Cochran got me back. Later on, I forgot what we were doing, but he made sure to drop me. So, <laughs> yeah, good time. I uh, I don't recall his name, but there was that older gentleman who was a hospital administrator, and he gave me my IV, and he had no fear of doing this. He went up with a shaky hand and then jabbed the needle through <laughs> and through in my vein. And I'm like, well, all right. Yeah. Do you want to well, try again? <laughs> <laughs> that guy made it. It was Bob. Afghanistan. Bob. Yes. He made it one day, right? Yeah. Yeah. One day. <laughs> Show it up at the unit. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> the I still remember Bob's phone call. Tell us about that. So so this I'm gonna give some background. Bob was a, a, an older guy. He wanted to deploy, had a lot of relevant skill for what we were trying to do in terms of hospitals. But you could you can kind of see that his heart wasn't really in it. Like it was fun, but like, mm, is he really gonna do this? And so then I think we kind of knew that he was not gonna last long. There was a rumor about that. But Trent, you get the phone call. What does that sound like? I deployed all the way to that hub and we were all sitting together. It was me, Will Hardy, uh, Kevin Cochran. Uh, Bob, Jeremy Bundrick, you know, there was a whole group of us sitting there and Bob decided to go call his unit. Uh, he gives him a call and he manages to reach a, uh, a sat phone 
that they were actually in uh, in contact at the time on their fob. So they had rockets coming in, indirect fire, explosions going off. Bob can hear this over the phone, and that's when he was just like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, that would be too much. Okay, so let's go back to Polk. Uh, Trent, you did something that was bold and, and you know, I mean, from a command point of view, not really. You had, but you had no authority. But you said, hey, we're going to do our own end of, end of training exercise. And you and I partnered on that. Talk about the process to get us going in a different direction and a more relevant direction. And, and why was that direction not correct? So when you say not correct, you're talking about the, uh, the original direction or... Mm-hmm. Yeah, the original direction. Oh, okay. So the original direction was designed completely around the combat advisor course, you know, the getting those guys ready to uh, advise foreign militaries. It had nothing to do with social cultural uh, research and analysis and doing operationally relevant research that would assist the, uh, the, the units. And so made a pitch to the, the commander down there and just said, look, we can write our own scenario. We've got three smart guys. The three of us can collaborate on this, write our own scenario, and actually use what you already have, just insert a different piece and let us work our piece of it while still integrating in the FOB life and patrols and whatnot. The old way, definitely irrelevant to our mission. And I think with what the three of us put together, me, uh, me, you, and I uh, uh, can't remember the gentleman's name now. Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin was the other one. Kevin Voigt. Um, the, the three of us put together a really good scenario. Yep, Kevin Voigt. Uh, put together a really good uh, scenario that allowed our HTS folks to get more out of that exercise than... Uh, just walking, you know, walking the line and, uh, and finishing out. John, what about you? When you go through that training, um, what were your thoughts on what you experienced and how did it compare to all the other training that we'd had up to that point? I mean, it's we as a group or me personally. Uh, so either one. Me personally. What, yeah. So me personally, it was still good. Like my, my first time, like, uh, interacting with foreign persons in a, civil military operations type style. I was, I was an infantry platoon leader. So you wouldn't think that, you know, that's the most likely place. But when I was in Baghdad, that was, you know, it's not that I was going to drag my company commander out to meet every, every person who purported to be a village leader. Yeah. I ended up doing that there. After I left active duty, I ended up in civil affairs and that's basically all we do. So, I mean, the, there's a big part of the engineering and contracting piece, but that's actually, at least from my point of view, that was a small part of the overall mission. Like our whole point of civil affairs is to work yourself out of a job. Right. Make it so that the, uh, whatever the local government is, can stand up on their own and do their thing without us. So anytime you get a chance to interact in a scenario where you're, you're trying to either empower someone else to do what they're supposed to do for the local population or you're supposed to identify a problem, see if there's a way that you can help a local area without making yourself the sole provider of that item. That's good stuff. So I'd say when we're at Polk for that last piece, I remember, I don't think I volunteered to lead any scenarios just because I, I felt like I had the experience already. So still, I mean, it was good to have some of the other guys go through it too and just watch. I'd like to say it helps on my uh, actual tour. So I ended up going to uh, Delaron province in uh, southwestern Afghanistan. So right along the uh, Iranian border. But the Marines definitely had a different way of working. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to say it was any better or it was any worse. Uh, it was a lot more kinetic than the Army, which I get it. That whole area was dangerous. The training that, that uh, I authored for us, uh, and I think you'll get this, 
I I made it so that it had no point. Like there was no puzzle to solve because you know a lot of times the army likes to do a training that's like, and then you you know win or whatever it is. But I purposely just made it like this is what a day is like when you patrol. You come back and you report, and if you take your time and you dilly dally, all the reports will be in, and you will be the last one in with your information, and you will be obsolete. So there were two big things I wanted to impress upon you know all of us when we were doing this training was. One, there is no point. You don't know the answer. Keep going out. Keep gathering information and get it back to the command as fast as possible. Does that does that make sense? Does that resonate uh, in terms of? Yeah. Okay. Good. Collect information and brief it. That's that's essentially the job on those kind of missions. It's funny because I don't re- if you recall, but I don't remember the gentleman's name. He was he was also like over fifty somewhere, and he had figured out what was going on between the different villages. And he was telling me what happened. He's like, "This village is doing this; they're poisoning the water." And I had to say to him, "That's not true. I'm the one that wrote it. I, I didn't write that in." But he was determined that he had solved the puzzle. And I'm like, that's the exact opposite of what we want to have happen here. Like, you don't know anything. You have to go back out tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and slowly piece together what this is. And you're not going to find, there's not a thread to pull, you know? Do you think, do you think it was just so disappointing to have someone get it so wrong? Ah. I mean, that's a good thing too, though. So the guy gets a taste of what analysis looks like. He goes out there and figures this stuff out. I think I know the guy you're talking about. There's another... Retired 05 yep. coming out. So, I mean, that's that's always been my contention with those kind of slots. So, no offense, but retired 05, not really doing the CA job and doing the yeah. going out, not doing the 03, 04 type deal, going out and doing the analysis, meeting those people. One of the out. things that I learned from the whole exercise, because I'd, I'd written scenarios before in the army, so that wasn't that wasn't terribly hard. I'd written roles, but it was the interaction with the with the role players and how many of these guys didn't even speak English, and you had to explain, you know, like the intent, like this is what I want you to do, this is how I want you to perform this role, and just the, how hard that side. And I, you know, if you recall this, Trent, when we went and they briefed us, and I'm like, oh my god, these guys don't know anything, and then. What on earth is the army doing with these guys if they're not taking all this care to get the message into these guys and what they want? Like, what are we even doing here, Trent? When when we did that that you know backdoor preparation of the um, of the language capacity, you know the actual Afghans. What we what were your experiences? And then in general, what did you think of the training that we created? Were you pretty happy with it? I was happy for the for the uh, beta test. You know that was our first run with it. I thought we did a great job. Um, I know that uh, you were a huge contributor to going and prepping those the, those language guys to make sure that the interaction was authentic. You know, you've already had your experience prior to um, the Polk experience, so you were able to give them more relevant and updated uh, ways to do the interaction that was actually effective. Was that a big leap for you? To let me author this training, for me, yeah. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I've you know I've worked on teams. I've worked on scenario development teams. You know, like I said, we uh, we designed that the original training uh, at Fort Riley for that thing. So um, this was an easy transition to turn over the, the ranks to somebody that's far more uh, experienced and and competent at doing that. I didn't have anything to offer to the to the language instructors. I don't know if you guys recall this, but the the moment that capsulized that whole training, the whole training scenario at Fort Polk, Tigerland, was when we sat in a room. This is for the audience. I'm going to describe this a little bit. We sit in a room and you're observing a meeting that's going on, so that you can you because you can learn things by watching a meeting. This is a common thing, and so in this fishbowl that we're watching the fish. There is a service member who's not a student and then a service member who's not a student. And they're talking about service member stuff back and forth. There were two uniformed military people talking to each other about supply. And I'm like, what are we, this is an hour of training where we watched people have a conversation that had nothing to do. Like there wasn't an Afghan in the room. There was no elicitation techniques being displayed. It was literally a conversation about logistics. Do you guys recall this moment? I think they rotate us through in groups and I was stuck with an air force group that was taking copious notes. <laughs> Remember that 
<laughs> oh, I I absolutely remember it, and it was an hour of my life I'll never get back. Yeah, there were, there were moments like that. Let me explain <laughs> this. I'm gonna explain this to the uh, yes. There were many moments like that. You know, <laughs> so we're in pre combat training. This place is scary enough that a guy heard gunfire over the phone and quit. All right, so this is real work. This is no shit dangerous work, and so. We're doing things like standing around. By the way, any second we stand around, it's costing the military, I don't know, let's say $50,000. Like any time this group stands there and does something, it's expensive to have us idle. And we learned skills that we were never going to use. Like we learned how to do a call for fire and, and, you know, all these different things. And, And some of this stuff, it's all military relevant, but we have a really hard job to do that really nobody else can do. And... We're watching someone practice. We, we did this whole picnic with the Afghans, I called it, because we all sat around and ate Afghan food, and it was supposed to be some kind of cultural immersion training. And you really, you just sat there and ate. It was, this job was way too hard to train at that level. Uh, <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> I get so frustrated. Trent, I, I know um, I'm beating up on the training, and you guys are doing your best. Did the training evolve and get better over time once you took over the program? It did be, you know, the, uh, everything gets better with iterations, especially when you have them, um, working to, to do the after action reviews, get the lessons learned, um, and then insert that. We also worked, um, this is after I, I moved from the team leader role into a, uh, into the director role. And that was, um, for us to continue to update based on, relevancy of what we're getting with the feedback downrange. What was the feedback? Um, so with our uh, evaluation uh, cell, we we did a lot of assessments with our, our supported units, asking them to provide their feedback of whether or not the teams are doing the right thing, if it's relevant. You know, we had, a, a uh, I believe, a six-question online survey that we sent uh, to all of our supported units, and it was 96% positive every time it came back, and that was, you know, the teams are doing good work, they're providing us with the information we need, it's timely and relevant. What are your thoughts, John? So, for my trip, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, the team leader I had is quite possibly one of the worst people I've ever run into. <laughs> <laughs> A guy named Gus Medina. Oh. But, uh, I mean, we did some things that, like I said, the, the Marines were a lot more genetically minded. And, yeah, it was a it was a terrain thing. So, if you guys heard about the Kajaki Dam. Yeah. So, local area in the southwest. So, just north of it, really kinetic. Just south of it, really kinetic. And everywhere around it, really kinetic. So we'd have a tendency of going out on these analysis missions where the Marines will literally just clear America. So maybe like the day before. So we would go on this patrol with a, uh, you know, we'd have a Marine dog with us and we'd talk to local police. And the questions and the answers are, I mean, the questions, yeah, they came from our social scientists, but the, uh, uh, the answers were basically what you'd expect in that kind of scenario. They're going to say whatever we want to hear because they know we're not going to be there very long. Because that was the other thing that Marines would go through, kill everybody, and then take off. So, and it was a lot of, I mean, it was less the atmospherics type stuff, which atmospherics would be a little disrupted anyways because you just went through and cleared the area. A lot more almost intelligence gathering. So we were definitely definitely subordinate to the two shops. So it wasn't a nine shop type thing. They had a civil affairs team from the army there. But they were kind of doing the same thing we did. Let me let me put some clarity in what you're saying so folks can understand. So 
in the military, they, they chunk out responsibilities. There's an operations person. There's there's um, it is there's supply like logistics. There's Intel, which is the two shop. There's all these different there's communications, like you know computer things. All these different offices, and civil affairs is one of them, and that's often called the nine shop. And so they're trying to decide where you put this asset, this HTS asset. Where do you put John when he comes in? And John comes in and says, "I'm a civil affairs officer normally, but here my job here is to help you guys with your people." And so maybe you get put into civil affairs or maybe you get put under, you know, this or maybe the commander just says, you're my team. You're going to roll out with me every single time. Yeah. I roll. It just kind of depends on the commander on how you get deployed. And, and one of the funny things that I, that I learned along the way with HTS is that uh, the commanders weren't really trained on how to use us. They had to sort of figure it out for themselves because there wasn't really a doctrinal answer that they had a command on. I mean, sure, they get a briefing, but then they just do what they want to do because there wasn't really – it was like, here's this tool. Just like there were all these tools the commanders would get. It was very modular. Like, here, here's this team. Here's an ag team. Here's a business team. Here's all these different teams. Go ahead and and enable them and go out and 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 kill the enemy. It was basically what would happen, and so you would end up in all these different spots. And that's what John's talking about. Is now we're under under this intelligence shop, which is a fair place to put us. Yeah. What was the best answer for that unit, though? Where should you have been? So they had. It seemed like the relationship with our nine shop was broken. Mm. So I don't know if the army guys that were there before us. So they. I mean, they were there on, uh, I think it was a 12 month tour, either a 12 month or a nine month tour, but essentially they had been relegated. You know, the brigade he- or the regimental headquarters were here, and the nine shop is like on the other side of the post. Bad. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You know, the brigade he- or the regimental headquarters are here, and the nine shop is, like, on the other side of the post. Bad. Yeah, yeah it's not a good sign. <laughs> so, so the two shop, I kind of felt like, yeah, we could have influence there, but ah, that's uh, just another Gus thing. I guess he was trying to sell the sell the capability as much as he could as intelligence gatherers. So that's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and, and it's one of the things that we do. I want to let Trent talk. Trent, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we had a, uh, a really good experience with the two different units that we supported. Uh, fortunately, the, the team that was there ahead of ours did a really good job with integration into the unit and uh, proved worth. So we were part of the uh, commander's special staff, and um, we basically flexed to his priorities and, and his mission. So we supported the, the two the seven, the nine. We did some stuff with the uh, with the uh, female engagement teams. We we kind of flexed all over the place and actually had one smaller team deployed forward with one of the battalions, and they were there almost full time, so detached from us at the brigade headquarters. One of the things I would do was I would share my patrol reports with a, w- a wide reading list to include all of you guys. Did that in any way help at all to see like what we were creating and to give you guys a picture? So oh, same. absolutely. Uh, yeah. Any anytime you have information sharing where we're able to provide information to each other, you may be seeing trends and you may be able to tie that together with um, you know what's going on in one region, what I'm seeing in my region, you may be, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a trendsetter, you may see this trend going on in yours, and it's moving its way into ours. So kind of giving us a heads up of indicators and things to look for in order to uh, properly advise our units and, you know, not let our guys fall into the same mistakes that someone else's. And what were you going to say, John? No, it was always useful just seeing reports from the other teams too. Just, I mean, even seeing the format of what you guys were writing, what you were doing with your information. What is see that? if we can do with our product. One of the advantages I had, you know, from multiple deployments was, you know, I'd been taught by commanders how to best use me. And they're like, they like, these are the words I want you to say to the next version of me. And it still took time. I was able to compress that time 
over time, over many units. But still, it took, you know, multiple weeks to become relevant to that commander. And I knew what to say. And I, I would you know, like I would say, you're going to put me under probably a captain. That's going to be the wrong spot. I need to work directly for you. But we'll get there. You'll see that. You'll see from my reports what I do. And then you'll want to give me access to the couch. And then ultimately, I would put him on the spot. I'm like, and in about three, let's say three months, you're going to look at me and say, you're my number one force multiplier. We couldn't be doing this without you. You know, you're, you're my guy. And you don't have to say that because we're saying it now when I already know you're going to say it. And every single commander would look at me and, and I'd be like, look, we already had this conversation. And I'd be like, yeah, but still, I want to, you know. So when it's done well and you can directly impact how the commander sees their battlefield, I mean, that's that was where the gold for me really was in, in trying to to give because here's what would happen the ag team would go out report success i would go out and be like i, I, I talked to the farmers they they weren't stoked you know <laughs> they were laughing yeah. uh i talked to you know the the farmer over here that grew pomegranates and he shrugged his shoulders and said i don't care what this guy says i'm going to do my own thing and the commander is going to lose his mind you know when the ca team sorry john when the ca team comes yeah. in and briefs hey we're going to paint the uh, government center, and that's going to make people believe in the government. I write that down. I go ask the questions, and they're like, that is not the government center. The government center is that dude's house over there. It's that hut. And he's the guy we go see when we have problems. And I write all that down and give that to the commander. Now they're like, okay, I have something to fix yeah. now, right? Yeah. But so that's only if you can <laughs> say it again. So, say it again. So who are we talking to and why? Yeah. It's the same thing. And the ability to get the commander to trust that information, though, is is vital, you know, because a lot of our teams would sit on the FOB, write these super long reports. They didn't communicate in the way that the military communicated. They wanted to write these magnum opuses. I have figured out the Baluchi people and, and how to how to understand them. Please stop. Trent, how do you deal with these problems where we have mechanisms that work? I'm very successful at, at working with these commanders. And then you have teams that are completely OBE the moment they get there because they just don't know how to keep up. They don't know what's relevant to the command. How do you, as the boss man, try to fix this big, goofy machine? Well, one technique, and, I, and we talked about it before, is to get a uh, an honest assessment from those units. You know, and, and so it went at, you know, with surveys. I did a lot of phone calls with commanders on the ground, so I'm staying up. Um, you know, till two, three o'clock in the morning so I can talk to commanders over in Afghanistan at their convenience, trying to figure out why, why teams are being ineffective and what it is. Sometimes it's personality. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, the, the team's inability to integrate. So each problem uh, seemed to be unique. And so each, each one of those problems had to be tackled separately. Some were successes, some you know, we never solved. Trent, is it a good program? Should we have this for, for units that deploy? Um, you know, I've, I've got my, my opinion on it, which is I think it was a good program, but it wasn't tenable in its current configuration. You know, you can't have, um, I think Kevin Voigt's actually called it this, you can't have a, a, a full-time capability with part-time staff. And that's everything from you know your your one year uh, social scientist or uh, human terrain analyst or re research managers you know fill in the blank each position they were here for a year and then they were gone that's all they were ever promised so some of our guys were fortunate to get uh, second tours but ultimately it, it needed to be a uh, a more uh, uh, long lasting and enduring program. And you can't do that with part-time help. Uh, but the other big issue I saw was uh, the individual replacement program. I mean, I, I was fortunate. We had one person from the uh, previous team stay and the rest of them redeployed. So when I deployed with four people that I had just gone through training with, so it was easy to integrate one person in and work well as a team who already had the experience on the ground. So, you know, it's, it's gotta be a team thing. And I really believe that in order to be effective, that when that combat unit is in their pre-deployment training at home station, that's where the human terrain team needs to integrate 
and actually deploy with that unit. So they've already started the integration. They started the training. They figured out where they belong in that unit's uh, uh, battle rhythm, decision-making cycle, et cetera. And so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of solutions. I think it's an effective program. Um, could it have been more effective? Absolutely. John, what would be your response to that question? I remember hearing it getting shut down, and I'm not sure to what level it was actually shut down. Like, if it sounds like HTS is a has its own separate component, is is done though. But uh, what did the army actually end up doing with the capability? So, did it end up rolling into civil affairs? Did it end up rolling into the uh, information operations guys? Because I know the Navy put a big big focus on information operations, but they just it, they made the definition way too broad. Right. So, right. Yeah. People coming in promising the world and all of a sudden captains in the ground, they're not getting the world. So, <laughs> so good way to lose credibility there. But I, I always wondered what the army ended up doing with what we had. Cause it seemed like it is useful. It would have been nice to have a little more country specialization in there. I guess one of the big things I learned from my HTS tour is depending on the background of your sociologist, that is going to be the problem in that region. So like the sociologist I came, I had had more of a environmentalist background. So when we're out there that everything had to do with water quality, everything had to do with food quality. I'm like, that's okay, but that's maybe there's a bigger world than just that. Yeah. yeah. So having that, that country specialization already, I mean, maybe six months of school, go somewhere, take an Afghan course and see what's going on over there. Probably would have been useful. So a little more specialization on the social scientist part, uh, the research manager role. It's, it's useful if they know the systems, if they know how to put it put together a civil military uh, information picture. So information map. So for the commander, that's always useful. And even the human trained analyst, that's... If you don't have people that are good enough at doing that already, you figure most of your army guys that are going out there on their first tour. It's their first time doing it live. So if you have a bunch of civilians that have done it before, that's awesome. I mean, regardless of whether they're doing it in the same region or not, at least they've already talked to Afghans like that. So uh, did the army end up doing anything with capability? Yeah. Trent, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to answer uh, John's question. That's uh, uh, they. I was part of the shuttering program with uh, with HTS. But one of the things we did about a year, year and a half prior to that is we started a program where we worked with the Army Service Component Commands. We had teams with Army North, Army South, Army Africa, and Army Central Command, which focused on that higher level. Um, when we shuttered the pro the human terrain system proper program down, the program continued in a different light and it's called the global cultural knowledge, uh, network. And it's still in existence today. It's still at Fort Leavenworth, slight change in mission, uh, far, far fewer people, but I believe more operationally relevant. They do more long-term things. They work more in the social science, sociocultural uh, methods and applying um, these different uh, uh, sociocultural aspects into uh, uh, studies that are now truly relevant at that level, uh, at that higher level, at the uh, COCOM and service component command levels. Yeah, that's interesting to be able to service the COCOMs. That, I know that that program was starting as, you know, that support was, was you were trying to grow that actually when you were taking over. The the ability to respond to a specific need. I, I guess if I was going to pick one thing I would like to see is, I agree with you, Trent. Like we used to go to NTC ahead of time, but it was just a rotation. It wasn't a unit specific rotation to, de, you know, prior to deployment. And maybe break off someone from the team in theater and have them come and go through NTC and like, this is no shit what it's like here where you're at. And then, you know, work with that commander to get them to see what's what asset they were going to get. Because there were times, you know, I stayed, I watched 
many units rotate over the top of me and they would come in and the biggest value I had for them was I could get them to stop making their mistakes sooner and start to apply some actual energy into the problems earlier. You know, and like at one point, this uh, it doesn't matter what unit it is because they all do the same thing. Like we have our battle plan. We're going to push the Taliban south to Pakistan. At the border, they'll gather and we'll annihilate them. Like, raise your hand. You're like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, yeah. like, uh, it's going to snow, by the way, not the fighting season. Uh, two, all of your vehicles are so old and so worn out, you're going to push out maybe 10 miles and then something's going to break and you're going to have to self recover. And then you're going to come limping back to the camp. And you, and guess what? Like, yeah, right. Well, we're going to go do this. We're going to push South to the border. (laughs) And you know what happened? They pushed South about 10 miles. They broke girls had to pee. Um, They had to figure out how to get off. They didn't know where the mines were. There were no mines. And so they were like, ah, mission over, turn back and come back. And their entire battle plan, the entire thing, was based on this annihilation of the Taliban. And yet the unit before couldn't make Taliban, dead Taliban show up anywhere. Like they, they, they would not engage because they don't want to be pushed south to, to the border of yeah. Pakistan. They don't want to die. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> and so they that. would avoid that fight. But they would absolutely <laughs> dominate the social fight. And they had all the influences in the town. And the unit got it. And to their defense, they figured it out pretty fast. And they're like, oh, okay. But one of the funniest things was is um, a giant piece of the mountain broke off and closed off the main pass that they wanted to use to get through. And we told them about this ahead of time because it had happened like right when they first got there, they would never know about it. And they're like, yeah, whatever. It's a rock in the road. We're like, we don't think so. We think it's pretty big. We'll get a picture for you. And we got a picture eventually. And it was like big enough for like a donkey cart to go under, maybe a very small car, motorcycle. Yes. But any military vehicle, not a chance. And the Afghans named this thing like the rock that could never be moved. And they like, like they, it, it was ridiculous. And, uh, and the engineer was like, there's not a rock on this earth. I can't blow up. And then finally, like when he went out there on a mission to look at it, he's like, I can't blow this rock up. We, there's nothing I can do to chip away at this thing and break it in any kind of timeline. That Like the entire battle plan was scuttled by a piece of a mountain falling off and then just this whole thing. So you're right. Getting in there at NTC to say, hey, this battle plan, focusing on the, the Arab Emirates and their financial influence, stop. Can you make clean water show up? Can you find out what's important to these farmers? You know, when... When you say rule of law, they have one. Do you know what theirs is? And if you don't, how are you going to negotiate the two rules of law? Anyhow, longer term capability on station specific to that area so that you can learn the elders once and stop asking the same questions over and over again. Stop promising the same programs over again as a military force. Having that person there to say, hey, um, here are the last five. I would do this all the time. Here are the last five units here in Baghdad. They've all had the brown hand shaking the white hand on the slide saying that we're going to fix this problem and then have them go, oh, wait, that's right. We all do the same thing. That's what I would like to see is that kind of capability where you're able to flex in pre-deployment, but also stay long enough to develop that capacity to understand that area. But, you know, that's not going to (laughs) happen. So ah, frustrating. Yeah, I always like the idea of having like a high level. So having what you were saying with the COCOMS trend. So now we've got the, I, when we say high level with COCOMS, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking the regional commands. Right. When we're in country, so like RC South, RC North. So it's someone at that level that actually knows, okay, these are the tribes I expect to be in this area. Okay, there might be a migration of uh, Hazaras going through this area. They're traveling in this place. Baluchis hate everybody. Uh, Iranians do a lot of business in Delaron districts, so expect to see Iranians around. And by the way, they don't all hate you. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's good information to give to a combatant commander in RC South. So that high level, great. And then build up on that low level, too. Have that HT... A human terrain analyst that's already, you know, he's gone out there, he does, he's done this before, and he doesn't look scary because he's wearing civilian clothes. Might have a beard, probably wearing slacks, might have a vest on. Yeah, we're going to make him carry an M4, but whatever. So, and the uh, research manager capability, I, I was always kind of iffy on that one. Like, it's good knowing someone who knows what the systems look like and how to 
upload it all in there. But uh, I think I ran into a research manager or two that couldn't write to save their lives. So reviewing those reports and putting that into a system is kind of, you know, that's, that's a step above them. And that ability to brief, every one of those guys has got to be able to brief because that's where you need to build right off the bat. Yeah, I would even change those designations. My era, it, it was less designation specific and it evolved into that because you had to kind of manage it. But I was technically an RM, but I did all of the jobs, you know? Yeah. And so how do you, how do you, well, anyhow, listen, whatever. How do you better select these people? By the way, Tom Barth was in there. I don't know if he's still watching, but he's, he uh, checked in with us. Hey, Trent, uh, what else do you want to add about HTS and that capability and your experiences? Well, I, you know, like we talked about, Pete, I think that it's definitely a capability that the Army can, uh, can use, uh, military at large. And, you know, the, the big problems to tackle are how do you, how do you make an enduring program last with, like John said, people that understand their jobs and know them without, with part-time labor force. So, you know, it's, it, I guess what I would say with HTS is the problem is still there. Um, we have different kinds of capabilities out there that are trying to fix the problem, but until there's some sort of unified uh, uh, program or directive that pulls it all together and does the right things, we're you know we're kind of stuck with all this piecemeal. By the way, t- uh, Kevin Cochran just checked in and says, "Hey, so what's up?" Holy Kevin? crap, it's Kevin! That guy was awesome. Missing yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I want to, John, you have to tell me, help me tell the story. And Trent, I know you're part of the story too, but you had kernel things to do. But the culminating exercise, you know, or at least in terms of field problems, was to have a live fire range where we drove through as a patrol and engaged targets on the side of a mountain, which is fun army stuff. Like, target right, target left, all these things, yeah. four vehicles in a convoy patrolling through. And it was supposed to be like this dramatic end of cycle exercise with live fire and gunners and drivers and tcs and everything trent was right it's like saying hey that's not what we do these some of these people are social scientists we don't need them shooting uh, you know live fire weapons but we still were forced to comply and and do at least the spirit of the exercise and so john what's your memory of how how that went when we did the uh, final live fire exercise oh that was a blast so who was in my truck? I was in the lead truck. So Mike, Mike, Mike was in your, your Mike TC. In there. Yeah, uh-huh. Mike was the TC. And we stuck, oh, yeah, uh, the social scientist I quit on his first day. He was the gunner. <laughs> we stuck him up on the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because nobody wanted Brian. to clean it. The Air Force guys were all super, super focused on this. I think half the HDS people were ready to take a nap. The catch up speed was uh, keep the fuck up. I remember yeah. telling everybody else that. So, <laughs> and I remember just hauling, just hauling ass through this thing. Yes. And the, uh, I remember Rob, he starts tracing the target back. So he starts shooting at it when it comes into range. And, you know, pop it, target pops up and it's bam, 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 bam. And he's falling all the way around. And we're like, screaming and tapping his legs no stop you're gonna shoot the people behind you so he never got that far but i I'll always remember the stream of cuss words from mike towards rob i thought the social scientist guy was gonna cry for a little bit but good times man i, I love mixing special operations people with social scientists who never touched a gun before i, I, I uh I remember pretty clearly the whole exercise thing because I thought the whole thing was ridiculous. At that point, my ridiculous meter had been filled up. And so that this <laughs> stuck out yeah. for me because, you know, the unit, God bless the unit trying to do the training, but, you know, yeah. they were not tactically. Real. One of the things, this is for the audience, one of the things they would have us do is anytime there was a culvert or a place where a bomb could be stuck, halt the patrol. Everybody had to get out and clear and wait. And then if you if you halt any patrol for an to go look for a bomb, you're never going to get anywhere. And if you find it, 
that's 10 hours of your day gone. So, so no one really does that. Uh, yeah. If you see something, you stop and you deal with it. But they trained us in a way that was overly cautious. And so Mike and I were talking about it because I was the, the rear vehicle TC. And he's like, if we see contact, we're just pushing through. And if we see a, a, a ravine, we're just going to drive over it before they can detonate anything. And we're just going to go through as long as you keep up, like we'll keep up, you know. And so we did the course in 15 minutes. And it's supposed to take like two hours. <laughs> Do you remember this? And we came back and they're like, what are you doing back? Like, well, we're done. Yeah. And then they're like, you can't be done. We're like, we're done. Here we are. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. And so they made us do it again. And then we did it faster. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, the catch up speed was no shit. We yeah. Fuck up. <laughs> we will not fall behind. And well, I, I promised, like, we're not going to fall behind. Don't worry. You know? Yeah. We'll, yeah. We talk on the radio and everything, but that was sort of like the, and Kevin was the driver, by the way, Kevin was our driver and Kevin had no problem keeping up. He just kept mashing on that right pedal. And we just kept, (laughs) we just kept not shooting and just taking our armor and putting it to work. They want to shoot at us with small arms. You're welcome. We're not staying. We're leaving. Yeah. Hey, uh, so John, you, you had, you had Mike in your vehicle. Yeah. Mike was the TC. Yeah, do you remember the report he sent back to hire when they kept calling for contact reports? No. Kind of wish I did, though. <laughs> it sounds like it would be pretty good. Oh, I, re- I remember it. It was receiving receiving fire, sending the same back out. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I mean, who there is going to tell him he's wrong? I got to see more combat than anybody else in that training program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good old war stories and everything else. I guess so. Just around the around the horn here, Trent. What do you want to add? Anything at all you want to say or any observations? I guess the big thing I want to add is I want to thank uh, thank you for the opportunity to come on and kind of keep an HTS alive. Uh, with uh, the breakdown show, this is, I, I think this is great. Again, I've said it over and over. This is a, uh, I think it's a good capability. There's a lot of work to be done based on the uh, old model that could make the improvements, you know, leveraging programs that are already in existence, like the, the GCKN, you know, at Fort Leavenworth and bringing it all under one umbrella but you know the the biggest thing is it was good seeing uh, a couple of the old uh hds fellows and uh and playing catch up yeah likewise john yeah uh first thing thanks for having me on and damn i miss you guys it's, it's great talking to y'all anytime you guys want to talk hds it's great uh i do miss my civil affairs time i do miss my hds time as far as uh, now I work in a training development role for the Navy. So I work for uh, NOC DSD in Orlando on the Sailor 2025 program. So big program. Navy's trying to redo how they do the training for all their ratings. So it's I'm I'm just thinking about all this stuff and it's just fascinating compared to you know like what we're doing now and going for the straight up how do I teach an aircraft electrician how to do his job better. And I guess I'll just say in general, you know, if you are interested in this kind of capability, you can always reach out to me, Pete, at BreakItDownShow.com. I've got dozens of shows talking about how to do this well, whether it's cultural competency or yesterday's show was talking about ethics, you know, and, and, and she's a PhD professor who teaches at the Stockdale School, you know, for the Navy. And they talk about ethics and, and how how do you ethically – look, fellas, you've all deployed several times – how fast do the ethics change on what is and was it isn't important? You know, like it's just impossible to expect someone to reliably go through this ethics chicanery and come out the other side with what they're given pre-deployment and how to how to survive that. You know, like hating the enemy but also not degrading the enemy. Like, uh, all right, okay, uh, you cannot. You know, ah, it's just so many things. And so to understand these things well at the HTS level or at the military level, you have to have this this bevy of of proficiencies whether it's language capacity or cultural capacity whatever it is there's a lot of things to master so we've got a lot of those resources here and uh, anybody who again wants that we did a whole a whole week on uh, the the SFABs the SFAB school is was looking to get some some information and instead of the standard things we 
we grab the actual pros that do this stuff well and, and put together some great shows. Again, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. Thanks, Pete.